first off, thanks for having me here. Uh, as I told them sitting here at the table earlier, it must be late in the year and you're, you're just digging the bottom of the barrel looking for somebody to speak to, in order to get me here. I only brought a couple of issues really to talk about. I could probably go on for hours uh, about the problems that we have, but uh, I would rather uh, maybe hit a few high points and then uh, find out what's on your plate, what's of interest to you versus what I think you want to hear. Uh, as most of you know, we're, I think today is about day 45, so we're halfway through the session. Uh, the House uh, is on schedule to deliver the operating budget over to the Senate uh, probably, it won't be next week, but it'll be the following week. Uh, there's a number of members that are, uh, I've ha I have three or four members that'll be going back to D.C. for Energy Council. And I think the Senate has probably eight or ten people that they're planning on sending. So. Uh, we'll get a little reprieve next week and then we will start. Uh, uh, the operating budget should come out. I don't expect any uh, big items uh, to, to crop up. Uh, there will be a number of uh, small changes to what the governor has, has announced, but uh, nothing one way or the other. Uh, capital budget is being worked on, as most of you know. Uh, you know that will be probably the last piece of legislation that we pass this year. Uh, we've been fortunate over the last number of years to have uh, uh, a high price of oil and while that is good for the state coffers, it's terrible for uh, municipalities and people that live in uh, uh, smaller communities and even larger communities because <coughs> energy, I, I think people are under a lot of misconceptions about energy around the state. Uh, I was speaking in Fairbanks here a while back and to their chamber, as a matter of fact, this was back in December, and you know they have a high cost of energy, and that's and that's what you continually hear. But when I got on the plane to fly up that morning, I checked the gas prices at our local gas station, and when I got off the plane in Fairbanks, I checked the gas prices there just to see what the cost difference was. When in Fairbanks that particular day, gasoline was costing 3.83 a gallon. When I got on the plane in Kenai, it was 4.13 a gallon. Diesel fuel was uh, 4.38 a gallon in Fairbanks, but it was 4.52 in Kenai. And so, so while I understand they have colder days and and more of them, uh, the price of energy everywhere is high. Uh, when I left Kenai Monday morning, uh, gas, gas in Kenai was $4.32 a gallon. I, I didn't check the pump here today, so, but I think it's cheaper here. Electricity on the Kenai is $0.22 cents a kilowatt. Here it's 9 or, but expensive, or uh, energy is expensive all over the state, and so I'm one of those that think that we ought to be putting money into energy projects that benefit the state, and, and, and we do that on a, on a regular basis, but, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's more that we can do, and there's, and there's other ways to be able to fund long-term uh, energy projects in the state instead of, uh, there's a bill in uh, that one of the senators currently has in to um, uh, give people another one-time payout to try to help them out for the year. And, and I understand there's people out there that are hurting. I talk to uh, people in Fairbanks that are paying more for the cost of energy for the month than they are paying for their house payment. Now if that was happening in Anchorage or if that was happening here, uh, people would have a lot different attitude on, on the cost of energy and, and should or should not the state invest in, in energy projects across the state. So. Uh, we'll probably get into that a little bit more. Uh, let's see, a couple other things that were brought up. Education. Senate passed a bill, a uh, BSA bill, uh, that increases education $125. And, uh, you know, the House is getting pounded right now from people that we need to pass that bill, we need to pass that bill. <clears throat> well, I can tell you here in Juneau, what that bill does is it gives Juneau $1.3 million. But Juno has told me, and I've heard two different numbers, uh, that they are $6.6 .6 million in the hole, 
current projections, or they're $5.8 million. But the bill that is currently before the House will only give them $1.3 billion, or $1.3 million. So, is, are people happy that that's what's going to happen? And, you know, the House has taken a different look at it. We realize that the BSA is an important component of the overall education funding system, but there are a lot of other things involved in there. Energy, as I just stated, healthcare cost, increased employee cost. There's a number of other factors that are in there that, that we think we want to look at and, and, and maybe address some of those. So the House is not going to just jump right on board and, and pass a, a BSA bill that we don't feel uh, addresses the issue. And some of the consternation in, in my caucus is results. We want to see results. And a number say that they're not seeing the results. Well, I can show you that my school district can show you improvement. So if that's what we're looking for, improvement, and that means you get more money, then does that mean my district gets more money because they can show improvement, but another district over here doesn't get money because they can't show improvement? Because then we end up in another more type case uh, where nobody wins. Uh, it costs the state money for lawyers, and that money I would just as soon send to uh, the education system. So uh, I've been a strong opponent, or a strong proponent of of education in my 12 years that I've been here, and I don't I don't see that uh, ending anytime soon. But uh, you know we we want to make sure that the money's going where it needs to go in order to uh, uh, fund the education system. Uh, redistricting was brought up earlier. Uh, you know I've talked with uh, some on the redistricting board. I think it's pretty m unless the court does something odd. Uh, I think that uh, redistricting is, is going to stay pretty much where it's at. There is still some concern over districts 38 and 37, but, uh, uh, you know, and the, and the court can certainly throw the whole thing out and either make them go do it again or uh, come up with some kind of fix. I don't see that fix being a, a, a big change. I think that the districts down here are going to stay about where they're at. And I think uh, most of the other districts across the state will do the same. Uh, Fairbanks, I think they had to move three or four hundred people or maybe six hundred people one way or the other uh, to fix the issue up in districts one and two. So I think that, uh, you know, and unfortunately, uh, Southeast loses a representative. But it's, you know, it's based on population. And, and uh, you know, I know that I would prefer to represent the current district that I represent, uh, but uh, I'm going to move and, and uh, it's, uh, you know, I'll represent the people of, of uh, Seward on the Kenai Peninsula and, and for once I'll have hope in my district because uh, hope's a little town. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I'll at least have hope. Um, You know, people are, people are talking about what's going on up on the hill, what's going on with uh, uh, oil taxes, and that's the biggest issue up there. You turn on your TV every night and you see a number of us clowns up there uh, talking about uh, energy and talking about oil taxes. And, uh, you know, the House last year passed the bill that the governor uh, had proposed. Uh, there's been some people that say, well, you know, it's a $2 billion giveaway. Uh, we were talking at the table just a few minutes ago about, <clears throat> I guess, what your, what your perspective is. Uh, most of you are business people, and so you, you see a, a, probably a bigger perspective than, than just certain individuals in the communities. But <clears throat> I've talked with legislators that said, why should I care what happens in the oil industry? Why should I care whether there's jobs or not? Because no one in my district comes from the oil industry. And maybe true. But I explained to them that where do you think the roads come from? Where do you think the ports, the harbors, the ferries, the schools? Where do you think all that infrastructure comes from? It comes from one industry, or 90% of it, and it comes from the oil industry. And if we don't have a vibrant oil industry, 
uh, all of Alaska suffers. And that's from, for, that's from the pre-kindergarten kids' uh, uh, school programs to the senior citizens. That money will not be available. And, and, and what I've seen uh, since we passed the original ACES program, and we can talk about, well, we don't have the information. We don't know what the, we don't know if we pull this string over here, what happens over here. And that's what's going on right now. We've spent the last year and a half, two years, three years almost now, talking about a, a, an oil tax rewrite. And the reason that we haven't done it yet is because, well, we've got to study it. We've got to get more information. We need to make sure we're making the right decision. But I can tell you, ACE is originally, when the current tax structure that we are under today was passed, it was passed in three and a half weeks. And it was, most of it was passed on the House floor in amendments. And so those that are still concerned about are we taking enough time to study this, they sure didn't study it whenever we enacted it. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying that there wasn't a change needed to be made. I certainly supported a change in oil taxes back in 2007, just not to the extent that we have. Because what we have now is very little uh, money being invested in the state of Alaska as far as exploration. There are corporations that are out there, smaller corporations, and, and, and they're a, a significant part of, of the oil industry. And they're out there and they're doing some drilling. They're trying to prove their leases. But one of the main reasons that they are is because the state of Alaska has roughly a 50% tax credit out there for them to go out and, and, and do that exploration. Will that mean any more oil into the pipeline tomorrow? No. Most of those, uh, most of those leases are away from infrastructure and, uh, and may or may not be developed depending on what that total cost is. But almost every one of those uh, smaller explorers to a T has said if the current uh, tax regime is in place, they will probably not invest in Alaska as far as production. Not at this time. Uh, you'll hear the naysayers out there saying, look at ACES, it works. There's more people working at Prudhoe Bay today than there ever has been. Look at the numbers. I wish I could pull the numbers. I've asked the Department of Labor. I don't think they collect those numbers in, in the forms that I would like. But I'd like to know how many of those jobs are maintenance jobs versus expiration jobs. As oil fields get older, the same as any other industry, more money is spent on maintenance. And that's what you're seeing is those, pro those uh, new jobs that are being created, uh, probably uh, north of at least 60% are maintenance jobs. Uh, while they're important, and I want them to keep the maintenance up, that's not putting more oil into that pipeline. And as most of you know, oil through the pipeline is declining at about six, seven percent. We're down to 600,000 barrels or, or, or less. And the only thing that's masking the problem that the state of Alaska is going to have with a revenue source is what the cost of that barrel is at 120, I think $122 a barrel today, something like that. Uh, if that oil drops to $80 a barrel, uh, state of Alaska is going to be hemorrhaging. The funds that are that we call a surplus today will be gone in a short period of time. And unfortunately, there's only one other pocket I see, and that's yours. That at some point in time, we will institute an income tax. And I'm not the chicken little, the sky's falling, that's going to happen tomorrow, because it won't happen tomorrow. But that's the only other option that's really out there. Uh, you can say, well, we can get into the permanent fund, and, and the legislature might at some point in time do that if it was bad enough, but that's a last resort. And the only other place is, like I said, your pockets, whether it's in the business pocket through a uh, corporate income tax, or whether it's through your individual pocket in the state income tax or sales tax. Uh, and unfortunately, we cannot tax the citizens of Alaska 
enough to pay for the government that uh, we've created. So options are out there. <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that uh, we don't we don't see that point, but I <clears throat> I can see it at some point in time. I think the Senate is uh, they're working as I said they're working on the uh, uh, Aces rewrite. The House is uh, sitting here waiting on uh, seeing what they come up with. And at some point in time, hopefully before the end of session, we'll decide uh, if what they present to us is, is doable or not. And then we'll make, we'll, the House will base its decision on, on that. Uh, I think that if it, if it does, if it, if it does incentivize uh, uh, investment in the state of Alaska, I think you'll see the House pass it. If it does little or nothing, uh, I don't know if we'll pass it or not even take it up uh, and wait till next year. You know, the, the, because what happens is if you pass something that does this, the next year if you come back and you say, we really need to address this, why would we do that? We already fixed it last year. That's, a, that's the fight you'll have uh, versus is it, is it right or wrong. Do I want to give the oil companies any more money than I need to? No. I think Alaska should get a fair return on, on their resources. And that's not only from, you know, oil and gas, that's mining, that's, you know, you can look at fisheries, you can look at, uh, you know, every industry out there. But uh, you can have a high enough tax that it drives uh, drive business away. Most of your businessmen, if you can make a better return in North Dakota, you're going to be investing your money in North Dakota. If you can make a better return in Azerbaijan, you're going to make an investment there. You're going to weigh the you're going to weigh the information that's there. You're going to weigh the risks, uh, and you're going to base your decisions uh, not only on you know I I, I think mostly on uh, on uh, uh, profitability and, and, and where you can get the best bang for your buck. So uh, that's the world that we live in the state. We need to make sure that, that, that we're open for business and that uh, and, and we can show that we're open for business. We can say it all day long but if people aren't investing money uh, you can pretty much figure that it's all lip service. Let me see what else did I have. Uh, That's probably about about it. I'd rather answer questions or attempt to. Anybody got questions? Pat? Mr. Speaker, the unfunded liability for PERS and mm -hmm. PERS initiative just keeps growing. Alaska is one of four states that has health care insurance merged with the pension program. <laughs> and a lot of our problems do that for rising health care costs. Just like we were in the employer. But from an ARP standpoint, we have a keen concern about the fact that most of our public employees don't have Social Security. And without Social Security, if they only have a defined benefit plan, we're concerned that they're basically at financial risk with, with longevity going up every year. Now, how can we fix this so that they will either have the Social Security guaranteed payment that they can't outlive or a defined benefit that they can't outlive? Well, and, and <laughs> I'm kind of concerned about it too because when you talk about a, a Social Security that you can't outlive, uh, the position that the federal government is in today concerns me deeply that we're going to see a Social Security system that, that we can outlive. Uh, I personally am not uh, expecting Social Security to be around whenever I get old enough to retire. I'm just a pup. That's what they tell me. Uh, we do have about a, I, I think the number is still around $11 billion uh, unfunded mandate. We've attempted to address that through uh, uh, <coughs> additional funding uh, in, the, uh, in the budget cycle. There's, all, uh, there's talk now about uh, investing an additional $2 billion in, into the unfunded liability to help try to pay that off. I don't know if that's the right answer. We're still discussing it. Um, 
you know, additional cost. And it's not just the state cost, it's municipality cost and, and uh, school district costs across the state that people don't realize. This year, I think the state's cost is about 600 and I don't sit on finance anymore. I only get to see the numbers every once in a while. But I think it's about $630 million, $680 million that the state is going to pay uh, to pick up all the additional cost in the municipalities and the school districts of anything over 22% on PERS. So if the rate is 38%, the municipality picks up 22 and the state picks up all the rest. And we made that commitment about going on six years now, I guess. And, and each year that cost continues to go up and I expect that it'll continue to go up. Um, you know, I was here, you were, you were, you were around uh, when we changed the retirement system and I don't think anybody really wanted to change it. But with a, at that time, a, was it a seven or 10 billion, eight or 10 billion dollar hole, at some point you have to stop digging. And so I think that enough time has went by, or maybe not, that, uh, you know, there's a number of different ways that uh, the legislature's looking at it, and I don't have the answer to which way we're going to go, but, uh, you know, there, everyone wants to, there's not a person in this room that's a business owner that doesn't want to provide a good uh, a, a, or a reasonable retirement for, for their employees, you know, especially their long-term dedicated employees that they work with. But at some point in time, it's the dollar comes into play, and you have to make a decision on what can you afford or what can you not afford. And, and you know, I mean, we made that decision, say, like I say, five years ago now, I guess it is. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to look at that program and see if, is, are there ways that, one, we can keep the, deficit or the, the unfunded liability from growing, pay it down, and try to take care of the employees, and, and I don't think we have all those answers yet. I mean, there's different uh, bills out there to take and, and allow employees to opt in or opt out. Uh, you know, I mean, the only advantage to, or one advantage to the uh, defined benefit plan that we have now is that if they leave in five years or if they leave in ten years, they can take their money with them, and, and it's their money. So. I don't really have a real good answer for it, but I know that, uh, you know, uh, at the time we had to stop the bleeding and, and now we're looking at uh, seeing is that the best, it was that the best thing to do? Anybody? Oh no, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> don't beat me up. Oh, I'm going to beat you up. Um, <laughs> just, just a question. Both the Juno Chamber and the Alaska Chamber, you know, one of our priorities is uh, oil tax reform. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you might have noticed that it finally took public testimony and had a great turnout for that. But could you just talk to us a little bit about what, how we can help as business owners and, and Alaska residents? You know, what's going to be most helpful? I mean, obviously, it's in the other body right now, but... You know, and, 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 and I don't know... Uh, you know, some days I don't even agree with myself. So, uh, you know, I just think that, that as I've told them, you know, when, I, when I'm in a committee, I know most of the people in the oil industry because I come from the oil industry. Uh, uh, so, but it's not the big guys that, that even though that's who it affects, they need to, they need to testify. But it's the smaller people, too, that are affected. You know, you get a restaurant owner that says, why do I care if the oil industry goes away? Well, the people that come and buy whatever products they have are in some way usually related to the oil industry, whether they're a contractor, you know, or whether a subcontractor or a supplier. You know, it just goes right down the list. and, and Oil affects every Alaskan, you know, I mean, on, on previous oil issues, uh, I've had people tell me I should excuse myself from voting because I, I, I'm a contractor. And I, well, you know, the people in my district sent me down here to vote on every issue. They didn't send me down here to vote on the ones I wanted or the glamorous ones or the ones I didn't want to vote on. 
that was the hard votes. They sent me to vote on everyone. And, and I look at it because I do come from an area that, that has oil platforms. I have a refinery. I have, I have an LNG facility in my district. I used to have a uh, urea fertilizer facility in my district. And, and I have a, a gas to liquids facility. If I'm not representing the citizens of my district on oil and gas issues, I'm not representing at least 80% of the people in my district. And actually it's more like 100 because the money from the permanent fund came from resource development and that came from mainly oil. And so every Alaskan has a reason to want to make sure that, that the oil industry stays uh, as vibrant as it can. And like I said, I don't want to give them away. I don't want to give away the farm. I think that there's a, a balance there where Alaska gets its fair share, so to speak. But then the oil industry also can the 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 uh, CEOs and the presidents that run the corporations here in the state. They've got to go back, whether it's to Houston, Texas, or or whether it's to Britain, or or whether it's to. Um, um, Trying to think where it's at in Oklahoma, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. They've got to go back there and convince the board of directors that Alaska is a good place to uh, invest their money. And if they can't make that, if they can't make that argument, if the conditions aren't right, then the investment doesn't happen in Alaska, and and Alaska, in the end, is is is. Uh, uh, hurt by it. I think that every opportunity you get, you should be up on the hill. And it's not because I, I agree necessarily that uh, uh, what they're doing is right or wrong, but you need to make your voice heard. If they don't hear your voice, then the only thing that they go by is the people that they hear. And sometimes a small vocal minority uh, uh, carries the day because there's not others out there that uh, want to stand up and take the time. I know we all have busy schedules. I know we're all busy. We're trying to make a living, trying to feed our families. But uh, if, uh, if you don't care, uh, it may not come out uh, the way you think it should. And even if you're on the other side, maybe you don't think that we ought to give them, maybe you think we ought to tax them more. You should let your voice be heard. The uh, sit at the end has mm -hmm. uh, come up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier this week, Commonwealth North came out with a study on rural electrification and transmission lines. Mm -hmm. um, if the so sit at the is going to cost $4 billion, could mm -hmm. we see uh, an equal commitment to the rest of Alaska in electrification? You know, and I don't have the answer for that yet, but what I can say is I can, I can talk to you a little bit about history. And, and a number of you here may know what PCE is, power cost equalization. What well, do you know where PCE came from? PCE came about, and this was before my time, but, but PCE came about because of Susitna, and because of Bradley Lake and the Four Dam Pool. And that was the trade-off, uh, and I can't, I don't remember what year, but that was the trade-off that for the state's assistance in building the Four Dam Pool, Sioux Sitna and uh, Bradley Lake, that uh, smaller areas around the state, rural areas, uh, would receive PCE. Well, PCE cost us, right, I'm going to say somewhere around $30 because it's either 28 or 36 I can't, I, somewhere around there. And so uh, that was the trade-off, is that rural Alaska would get PCE and, and the state would help uh, on Bradley, Four Dam Pool, and Susitna. Well, we built the Four Dam Pools. We built Bradley. So Sitna was never built. So I, I, hate to, I hate to use the word trade-off because I think that we as Alaskans need to make sure that we try to address all the energy needs across Alaska, 
not just in rural Alaska, not just in, in uh, urban Alaska, but all over Alaska. If you look at southeast here, Ala uh, the state of Alaska has spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and I don't know how much that might be, but on uh, hydro projects. It makes sense. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars on inner ties. They make sense. That's what we should be doing in this area because it makes sense. Is it economical? If, if Juno had to pay for all the costs associated with Snedder Sham or any of the inner ties, I, hate, I don't know what your electric costs would be, but they'd be considerably higher than the nine cents or 11 cents, whatever you pay right now. Uh, so I think that we as, it, we as the legislature do that. Last year we spent 400, 450 million, I can't, man, it's probably 350 maybe after the governor made a few cuts, but uh, uh, the legislature has stepped up to the plate and funded energy projects all over the state. And I think that, that we need to do that. I hate to see us saying, okay, I want to trade you, I want to trade you uh, Susitna for uh, uh, the all-Alaska all gas route. Or well, I want in-state gas pipeline, and I'm going to trade, it, trade you three, power, or three, uh, uh, three dams and, and two uh, inner ties. I think that we need to make sure that we try to address all the needs. And, and we can't do it today or tomorrow. There, there's not enough money there. But where we can do inner ties, we need to be doing those. Uh, where we can bring other types of energy, whether it's wind to some of the communities. I was in one here a while back out by Bethel that 20% of their electricity was generated by wind. Uh, may not be a big deal, but if you're, if you're paying $9 a uh, a gallon for diesel fuel, as some of those places are, 20% uh, wind, especially if, if the state has funded the infrastructure, and, uh, you know, you don't have that cost, you have operations and maintenance. It makes, it makes sense, but we need to make sure that the money that we're investing in energy projects actually puts power into a grid somewhere, whether that's a BTU and a gas pipeline or whether that's uh, electricity into the grid somewhere to, to uh, uh, turn on the lights. But we need to, we need to make those investments, and, and I think the legislature has been doing that over the last number of years. And I think we'll continue to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you, a couple of times I've heard you mention the urea refinery that you had in your district, mm -hmm. and, I know, and I think I heard you say that it's shut down now. Mm -hmm. And I know that, I'm pretty sure that Juno uses that on our roads to melt the ice. I mean, mm -hmm. where do we buy it? And then why did your plant shut down? Yours probably comes from Canada or someplace else. Uh, urea is a, is a, it's a fertilizer and, and they will use it occasionally in, in roads uh, more down south than they do up here to, to melt the snow. Uh, it was a urea ammonia, ammonia fertilizer facility. It uh, employed roughly about uh, 450 people at uh, average $85,000 a year jobs. Went away because of, of you can consider it two reasons. Uh, the biggest reason is uh, uh, to make urea or ammonia. It's a process that uses natural gas. And with the declining production of natural gas in the Cook Inlet, uh, that and probably cost but I think more related to uh, uh, not a steady supply of, of uh, gas. That facility went away after f 40 years. Wow. I mean, the gas in Cook Inlet, when it was originally found, was stranded gas. And so to make it, <clears throat> to be able to utilize that gas, they built a urea ammonia fertilizer facility and they built an LNG facility, the only LNG facility in the U.S. Uh, it has it has shipped gas to Tokyo Light and Power for the last forty some odd years, uh, and it's a uh, it uh, and that's the only reason that there's really any gas distribution system in the whole Cook Inlet. If they hadn't have found that gas and started developing that gas for those two particular facilities, there's not enough consumers 
to really make a market. So, uh, you know, so now we're talking about declining gas production in Cook Inlet. We've incentivized that enough that uh, we have some, a couple of drill ships that are coming in. We actually had one in this summer. Uh, supposedly they found a gas, uh, a new gas field or a gas find. I, I hope they did. My concern is, is what if they didn't? You have the biggest uh, um, section of Alaskans uh, living along the rail belt. Uh, people are under the misconception that everyone in the rail belt has cheap gas. It doesn't cost us nothing hardly. We just, you know, it's cheap. 50% of the people that live on the Kenai Peninsula are not on the gas distribution system. They still heat with oil, coal, uh, propane, or electricity. So uh, um, I'm a strong supporter, uh, as some of you may know, of an in-state gas pipeline. And uh, you know, that piece, we've got a couple pieces of legislation that's moving through the uh, legislature and uh, we'll continue to push that. I think it's imperative that, that the rail belt, as, as others have stated, I think it's, it's imperative that the rail belt has a, a energy grid that they can depend on, no different than any other community. Uh, without that, right now we have uh, uh, an ad campaign going on talking about uh, uh, red light, yellow light, and green light, and what you're supposed to do if, uh, if, if they start cutting back and maybe brownouts or partial energy uh, uh, shutting off the power just simply because they don't have enough gas to uh, fill the gas distribution system. That's not a way that Alaskans uh, want Anchorage to live. And, and, I, and I don't mean it negatively, but you know, the last thing Alaska wants to see is Anchorage go cold because they have enough power in the legislature that they can control the legislature and they can control every every dollar of money that comes into this state and where it goes if if they you could ever get them on board on the same project and and this would be one of them you know there's billions of dollars of businesses uh, personal homes uh, and so on that could be destroyed so uh, I think it's imperative we come up with a, a long-term energy supply. I don't know if uh, the in-state gas line, people call it the bullet line, I don't know if that's the answer. But that's the only project that's moving forward in Alaska today. A GIA is not moving anywhere, and it hasn't. And even though I voted against it, I never thought that it would bring us gas like uh, some proposed that it would. So she's uh, standing up, she's telling me to sit down, shut up. <laughs> Uh, anyway, folks, thanks for having me here. I probably didn't ask or answer or give you any, uh, any hope. I, I certainly think that uh, the legislature is going to move forward. We're going to have a capital budget. Uh, we'll get out of here hopefully in 90 days. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, there will be a number of issues that we tackle that uh, will be a benefit to not only your community, but uh, hopefully overall to the uh, vibrance of Alaska, so thank you.